Okay. We'll call the February 24th, 2020 um, school board meeting to order. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and Anita is going to be excused this evening. If you would do the roll call, um, Stacy. Uh, Barb Wedstein. Here. Rebecca Reber. Here. Anita's excused, you said? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Lizzie Peff. Here. Brian Wolpat. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Okay, so with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been sent and distributed to the local media with this in mind. Are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Gary, is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded to approve the agenda as published. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Um, public participation. I do not have any cards this evening. So we'll move on to district administrator's report, Dr. Mueller. Yeah, so coming up this next week on March 3rd or 2nd is our statewide ACT exam. And that's so all juniors in the whole state on that same day get the fortune or opportunity to take the ACT. Um, and actually, Lindsay Seip is with us this evening, and she actually helped um, our freshmen, sophomores, and seniors um, get to have quite a great day with their AC academic career planning um, while the juniors are taking the ACT. The ninth graders get to, will be visiting Quick Trip, Train, Dave's Guitar, the Weber Center, Fall and Hammer, Fastnell, Fort McCoy. So they get to kind of choose where they want to go and see how that can be possibly a career pathway for them. Uh, meanwhile, the 10th grade students will visit local colleges and universities um, around the area, Winona, La Crosse area. And then our 12th grade students, um, I saw today, they're going to have a wellness day at home in high school, and they have many different sectionals that they get to um, choose in from to attend. So just thank, thank you so much for putting that great um, event together for our students that day. Um, and then next week is the Read Across America Week. So we have a lot of events going on in our schools and festivities to cook up, kick off, and we'll have many people coming in to read to our students. So, and we want to thank our Home and Area Foundation once again for a grant. They're providing every public preschool, um, each one of our 4K students, and the, the students at Viking Elementary um, a book this year. So, and they'll have a guest, um, well, they'll have some guests appearing and just lots of fun in the schools with the Read Across America. And then, um, boy, it's been busy. Our wrestling team will advance to the state tournament. They beat Wanakee at sectionals, 55 to 18 is in that. Um, it's their fourth consecutive trip to the state tournament as a team. But before that, um, coming up actually later this week, we have six individuals. Um, Parker Cradiville, Sam Smith, Alex Powalski, Branson Beers, Carter Vetch, and Drake Shams all qualified for individual state tournament. So they've been um, doing a great job and accomplishing a lot there and they're heading off to Madison. And meanwhile, um, I had the fortune to travel to Iowa this weekend my, with the show choir and they got state champs, um, and they were against teams from Nebraska and North Dakota and South Dakota and mm -hmm. it was Minnesota. Um, and they got best choreography and um, best yeah, best band again and grand yep, grand champions of the Shakes the Lakes <laughs> in that. And then uh, uh, Mr. Shams, he got the best male vocalist again. So mm -hmm. our students are just accomplishing amazing things and really. Um, making home and known, I guess you could say. So we thank them for that. Thank you for recognizing those efforts. Um, and then moving on to recognition and thank you, National School Breakfast Re Week. Yeah, so for more than 30 years, the school breakfast program has contributed to the health and educational development of our state's children by making our nutrition breakfasts, breakfasts in our school. Um, so we're gonna celebrate that with our nutrition services staff. And we just thank them and Mike Gasper for, Gasper for all their efforts in providing such a um, great breakfast and such variety too up at the high school and middle school in the mornings. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. So then moving on to reports and dis, um, discussion, there's the RPR contract extension, Julie Holman. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight I'll be talking about an extension agreement um, with Kevin Malin of Malin LLC. Uh, last April, the board approved a proposal to contract with Kevin um, to provide professional services related to the construction of the addition at the high school. Um, tonight, I'm um, sharing with you a recommendation to extend his contract through the remodel project. Um, the remodel is going out to bid very, very shortly, and uh, we would like to retain Kevin through that transition from the addition project to the remodel project. Um, so we'd like to extend that. A copy of the extension agreement was provided um, in your Google Drive. You'll notice that it's uh, abbreviated because it's an extension of the original agreement. Um, so that would be available also still in the drive from last um, April, I believe, March and April. So if you wanted to look at that further to take a look at the full, uh, it's many, many pages. <laughs> um, so this is an extension. The cost estimate is Exhibit K within the agreement and the cost Costing is the same as the original um, on the per hour basis with an estimate of an additional five hours per week for the remodel over the course of that project. Um, we expect it to go through December, um, so there's a retention at the end until the, all the punch list is completed um, and then the remaining contract would be paid out. So the estimated cost of the extension is 24775 that includes um, supporting costs for an additional six month extension on Kevin's liability insurance, which is a requirement of the agreement. Um, so we'd like to recommend that extension for those services um, through this year. Any questions on that? That will appear on the March 9th um, agenda. Okay. Thank you. Then recommendation related to audit services. So this is in reference to Wisconsin Statute 120.14 and policy, local policy 684 regarding annual audit services. The district seats competitive proposals for auditing services on a recurring five-year schedule. Um, in order to maintain competitiveness with those vendors, we uh, requested proposals and we received three as of the February 3rd, 2020 uh, deadline. So within the proposal, we um, presented it similar to prior audit service proposals and common practice where there are several criteria within the proposal and it's not a lowest cost only basis. So um, the criteria have been shared with you in the issue paper and they include things like the qualifications of the staff, supervision, size and structure of the firm, t um, same type audit audits under consideration, similar entities size wise, um, and then there is also a cost component. So it's a weighted um, criteria for a total of 150 points. I'd like to recommend that we award the contract for fiscal years 2020 through 24 to Hawkins Ash CPAs. They scored 102 out of 150. Uh, Johnson Block came in second with 88 points and Ingelson with 65 points. Again, this is not a lowest cost. That is only 17% of the rating criteria. And the cost proposed by um, Hawkins Ash is 17,000 for the audit for the 2019-20, or the one that uh, we're currently in, through uh, 2024. So ranges from 17,000 up to 20,000 in that fifth year. So I would like to recommend to the board to award fiscal years 2020 through 2024 to Hawkins Ash. Um, Hawkins Ash CPAs, um, and this will be on the March 9th uh, uh, consent as well. Any questions on that? Okay, no, thank you. Thank you. So then the Youth Risk Behavior Survey outcomes. Matt is gonna present on that. <laughs> All right, we get to take a look at the Wisconsin Youth Risk Behavior Survey. These are the 2019 results, um, and this is taken every two years. Uh, 
Wisconsin DPI and the Centers for Disease Control collaborate on the survey to collect the data and uh, publish the reports. It's an anonymous survey that's taken during the school day. Um, child participation, student participation is voluntary. Parents are notified of that. We had students in 8th through 12th grade complete the survey. 906 of our students in 9th through 12th grade took the survey and 263 8th graders took the survey. <clears throat> I mentioned it's conducted every two years. The window for the 1819 school year was January 7th to March 29th. Um, there is no way, since it's an anonymous survey, to track the data back to students or individual students. And we can make comparisons from 2017, and I will often in this presentation, from 2017 to 2019, but it's not necessarily the same cohort group. All kinds of questions are asked in various categories, motor vehicle safety, school safety, school climate, mental health and well-being, sexual behavior, tobacco use, alcohol use, drug use, technology use and online behavior, physical health and nutrition, and trauma and adversity. So it gives us a wide range of different youth behaviors and their implications for students. In the area of motor vehicle safety, and a lot of these graphs, or a lot of these charts have included comparisons to La Crosse County, so you'll note that the high school students um, are more likely than La Crosse County high school students to wear a seatbelt always or most of the time. The question was phrased a little bit differently in 2017, but we did see a significant increase from 75% to 95% of students doing that. Now, we have some work to do with texting and driving, and Dr. Mueller and I kind of reflected that probably some adults do as well. Um, <laughs> we have 44% of our students who texted or emailed and drove within the last 30 days. School safety is an area of success for us. School safety and school climate will be the next two I highlight, but you can see that more of our students, 83% in comparison to 81% in La Crosse County, feel safe at school. And there's a significant difference between students in La Crosse County, 27% to 18% at Holman High School, thinking that violence is a problem. <clears throat> Several questions aren't asked of middle schoolers, so you'll see that NA right there to indicate that. <clears throat> School climate, again, another success for us. 21% um, of students in La Crosse County experiencing bullying in the last 12 months. That stayed consistent with us at the middle school, but 18% in the high school. In the high school in 2017's number was 21%, so we did see a decrease there. Students who are electronically bullied, you'll note the 16% number for Holman High School, that was 17.7 in 2017. And you'll see bullying is a problem at 41%. That was 50% in 2017. So I would credit our high school and middle school counselors and administrators and teachers for creating a culture of reporting and acting on um, things that students <coughs> identify as bullying. Also important to note there, and I just mentioned students identify as bullying, there's no definition of bullying given in this report. So a student may perceive something as bullying that wouldn't meet our school definition. Included a graph here um, just to show as we talk more about bullying the gender difference in terms of um, females at 51% in Holman High School feeling like um, bullying is a problem at their school and males at 31% and just briefly visiting with counseling teams um, they noted that that is something that they notice as well. Those numbers are different as well for 2017. In 2017, 59% of females identified bullying as a problem and 42% of males. Uh, when we think about mental health and well-being, the best comparison here, because some of these questions have changed, um, especially to include the last 12 months, the best comparison is just to look between county and high school or county and middle school. I would try to think of this as the amount of things that we do and have done since 2017, so including things like um, adolescent mental health training, uh, more robust threat assessment process, we have peace of mind counselors, and um, our, our middle school counselors especially have been very reflective of um, what barriers that families experience in terms of getting more mental health services outside of school, so I'm sure our high school teams do the same, but heard that explicitly from middle school counselors.
Anxiety is another interesting graph with students self-reporting anxiety and especially in terms of the gender difference there between females and males, 62% to 33%, something that's noteworthy for us as we look at this data. Again, comparisons here in the area of sexual behaviors between La Crosse County and Holman High School, you'll note that we are either are similar to the county or down in a percentage point in a couple areas. <clears throat> Not a lot of great comparisons, again, in the tobacco, alcohol, and drug use from 2019 to 2017 because of the times changing just a little bit. But again, those county comparisons in most categories were just a little bit below where the county averages fall. Many of these questions in 2017 asked about a lifetime, where now they're looking at time periods of 30 days or 12 months. Vaping is a common topic um, in our high schools and middle schools and something that we um, will take a look at here. Um, important to note, again, gender differences, not huge here. This question can also be asked and was also asked if you've ever vaped. The graph that you'll see here is about 30 days. In um, terms of ever vaping, 36% of our students, which matched the county average. And again, there was a little higher percentage in, at Holman High School, 40% of females, 31% of males. The county was fairly similar to that with 39% of females and 34% of males. <clears throat> Some good comparisons as we look at screen time. I think this one's really interesting. The difference from Holman Middle to Holman High School in terms of screen time. Um, so I try to think to myself, what would change that so significantly? And I think of our high school students, Lizzie, you probably are a good example of this. Very busy, perhaps working jobs or different things that um, impact that maybe weren't in place in their lives in middle school. And screen time and sleep are connected too, so you'll note the difference from middle school to high school there. And just a couple other things we have in place. I think of our food pantry programs that help this bottom number here. And uh, we'll see a little decrease from the county average in terms of students experiencing hunger. The middle question, the lived in four or more residents, is that just ever lifetime? That's a lifetime question, yep. I just included a couple things we talk about, and um, I, th I wear the school safety hat too, so we think about um, how to stay connected to students, and this is one that I think we have some real, we can make some real tangible gr growth pretty quickly. Um, so here's La Crosse County in terms of students who have at least one teacher or adult they could talk to, 73%, Holman High School at 71%, and Holman Middle School at 70%. So. Just an area of reflection, I think, for us and our teams of how we can increase that number. And um, some things can get pretty complex when you think mental health and anxiety and the different services that we can provide. But this is one I think that we can take some really tangible steps just to con continue connecting with our students. So we're continuing right now to meet with student services teams and evaluate and look at this data. Um, some of our data comes to us in terms of different representations of groups. We did a lot of male-female comparisons, but we also have that data available to us in terms of our LGBTQ population and different underrepresented um, groups that we can evaluate how they're feeling about certain aspects or how they're behaving in certain areas. Definitely continue to determine the areas for growth, how they can be impacted by our school structures, and if there are community partners that we need to support <clears throat> students. Um, seems like our state, the state of Wisconsin, is ready to offer different programs to take advantage of mental health funding, so that'll be something we continue to look into. And once we have that knowledge, we want to continue implementing that knowledge of students and responses into our trauma-informed trainings and practices. So, why RBS? Any questions? I just want to say thank you. I said that earlier to Dr. Mueller. There are some school districts who will not release their individual school district outcomes in this, sure. and they keep it within the county, so they allow the tests to be taken, but they refuse to allow the individual data to be released. 
and I really appreciate that you do share this with us. Um, it's important that we see the data and that the community know that knows that we're addressing these things yeah. and that we have the courage to do that. So um, I appreciate that, the information that you have. It's certainly a powerful tool, I think, for our student services teams and administrators and teachers to see that. So. It is. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, I Thank didn't you. realize that that's it's important. Yeah, because their their numbers may look a lot different than ours, and when you have school choice issues, if they don't look as good as ours, then that gets put out there. So it's good to be a, yeah on the table. Yeah, it is. So then Melissa is here because we have a few handbook language issues that will be coming to the board on the ninth, and I know they've worked. Most of them have worked their way through. Correct. So, so all but one of these has gone through our full process and I'll explain why we've got a little change with the last one but um, first we'll look at paid leave. Um, these were all presented at um, the employee relations team in January and then to personal and governance last week so um, that should be fresh on everyone who was there. Um, so with the paid leave there's two different changes that you'll see. The first one is extremely confusing. Um, so when we created the, the employee handbook back in 2010, we made these language changes. And as you can see, we struck number three and we struck some items in number two and we pulled the serious health condition from three up into two. Well, what we missed was right here, the reference to number three, which we eliminated and merged into two. So we have to now go back and change that three to a two since we incorporated that language. Mm -hmm. So um, so making a correction um, and clarifying and kind of broadening up our opportunities for staff to take some leave in that um, what was initially intended to be changed and just was missed in the handbook. So um, the second change for paid leave is really to help um, explain and clarify for staff that the emergency leave days come from the allocated paid leave days, that they're not an additional five days of leave. It's something that if they use those days, it's deducted from their allocated balance of paid leave. Um, moving on, the second item is extra duty pay. So um, this, again, not something new, but something that we already pay for. So, and just adding reference to these extra duty assignments that we currently have and have been paying for, we're just not reflecting them in the handbook. So um, someone who keeps books and someone who does press box PA are paid accordingly um, in that schedule. Um, so just reflecting that. Um, the third one is the work schedule. So this is related to teachers. Um, for our teachers, they currently have a 191 day contract. <clears throat> that one extra day that we have is a flexible staff development day for them. Um, because it is part of their contract, we have to follow the Fair Labor Standards Act and pay them within a certain amount of days that they actually work that. So um, that really, squishes us into a certain amount of time that the teachers have to use and take this professional leave and doesn't really open them up to all the opportunities that they would have available to take um, different opportunities of professional leave. So um, we're gonna take that one day out. They'll still have to work that day, but it's gonna be in on your honor. They just need to let their supervisor know, um, but it will allow them anywhere from July 1 to June 30th to use their professional leave so uh, or take this professional day so um, they could take a seminar in the summer um, when they're not working or it could be something um, maybe there's something on one of our off days that we don't have school that they want to take that um, and right now they're really restricted when they can use that day so um, the other change in this specific section is in reference to um, the makeup of a weather day. Um, right now, the language says that we have to make an, a third or more inclement weather day up at the end of the school year. So um, our recommendation is to change that language to say at the discretion of the district administrator, just to give us flexibility so it's not that we have to specifically go and extend the school year. There might be opportunities then that opens up for us to um, think outside the box and make those up differently. So. 
And then the last item, um, this has gone to personnel and governance. Um, the formal changes you see in front of you have not gone to the employee relations team. However, the concept has gone to them. And they said, move forward so we can keep going through with this. Um, we kind of skipped ahead because there's things that need to happen right now that if we didn't bring it to the board at this point, it wouldn't be able to happen next school year. So. Um, there's lots of changes you see in here, and the concept of them is adding year-round pay for our teachers. Um, so currently our teachers are paid 22 pay periods over the course of the school year, so once school starts until the end of June, this change will give them an option of being paid as they currently are, or they can be paid all summer long and throughout the school year as well. So um, there's quite a few changes in there, but really they are specific to um, the year-round pay option. Um, there is one extra thing we added in there, the extended individual contract contracts, um, adding a deadline when those days have to be turned in so we can um, pay them in a proper time frame and before our fiscal year closes out, so. Okay, any questions? Any questions on those? They will be on the agenda on the 9th. Correct. So if you have any questions, please let Dr. Mueller know. Thank you. But thank you so very much. I think those are gonna be welcome, especially the last one. So we have um, seven items on the consent agenda this evening. Unless anyone has one they would like to have pulled and considered separately, <clears throat> I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then moving on to board member reports and discussion. I'll call on board members for any um, committee reports or discussion that you'd like to share. So Barb. I don't have anything tonight. Okay, Rebecca. I do not have anything tonight. Um, Brian? Uh, personnel and governance met last Wednesday and we covered a good, a good chunk of topics. Okay. And then Gary? Well, I just want to congratulate the show choir. They did an awesome job. Mm -hmm. Just kept going down the list and just kept winning and winning and winning. It was awesome. And of course, the wrestlers, they've been doing a great job. Uh, they've been doing a great job for the past few years. And I'd like to thank everyone for all the fast and hard work they did on uh, getting the teachers to year round pay. Here, I think that's going to be a big plus for some of the teachers. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, Tom? Gary always said, says something I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think I take my back. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my kids enjoyed show choir a lot. They didn't do the singing. They did the music, but they always really enjoyed it. And just one warning for everybody in this room, it's getting slippery out there. Oh. Oh. Okay. Slippery. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Lizzie. Um, I just have something short to say, but I wanted to um, say thank you to everyone who works so hard with the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, because that is so important, and taking those things seriously, um, is it makes such a difference in students' lives. So it's really um, uh, good to look at those numbers, even though they can be really hard to see, I had no idea that some of those numbers would be so high. So that definitely gives a new perspective um, on school, but knowing that those numbers are taken into consideration all the time and that we're working on improving them is really great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then I would just note that we, um, SALT committee met and we discussed a number of policies, the acceptable use of technology, use of sacred music in schools, student dismissal, animals in school, high school credits for classes taken at the middle school. So we're looking at some of those things. Um, some of those policies will come to the board um, for approval and have. I, tonight we had a couple of them here. I know we're working on a couple others that um, we continue to take through the the all of the policies, the administrators, and then the educators that are um, working on them. So we continue to 
look at those sorts of things. Of course, keep in mind class size, I think, was approved, and we're working on that and talking about um, how that's going to forecasted and starting starting with that now as we look forward. I'm sure you're already working on um, some of those numbers and, and those sorts of things. So I appreciate all the work that's always done on that type of work. I also would note the um, <coughs> Spirit Lake competition. So I have a, a great niece who lives in Ankeny, Iowa. They have a really nice um, show choir as well there and they heard about Holman winning so my niece <laughs> sent me a message and said she heard a Wisconsin school won the Spirit Lake competition and could it be Holman and I'm like yes it could be and so yeah we were really <laughs> proud of that that was kind of fun to have that across the miles so um, so I that is all that I have for this evening um, I would note that we have um, a meeting coming up on the 9th and also on the 23rd um, with that, unless there's anything else to bring before the board, I would enter, or I would have someone read the closed session motion, if someone would. I can read it. Okay, Rebecca. Thank you. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby moves to adjourn into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.85, paren 1, paren C. Considering employment, promotion, compensation or performance, evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercise responsibility. In this case, the district, district administrator's evaluation. Okay, so is there a second? Second. Okay, and then Stacy, if you would do the roll call, it's either a yes or no. Barb Woodson? Yes. Rebecca Reber? Yes. Anita's is not here. Um, Brian Mopet? Yes. Gary Dunlap? Yes. Cheryl Hancock? Yes. Tom Cruz? Yes. Okay, so we will be in closed session in about three or four minutes.